All right, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to present joint work with my colleagues Fabian and Mark, um, both at Saarland University when we did this work. Mark has now moved on to the University of Oxford and is not here. Fabian is sitting here, so you can talk to him later as well. The talk is on the weak call by value lambda calculus, and it's on how to use the weak call by value lambda calculus as a model for computational complexity theory. And we prove that it's reasonable for time and space, meaning that, oops, meaning the following. So the definition of reasonable machines is from 1984 by Slot and van M. de Boers. And they have, they have a claim saying that reasonable machines can simulate each other with a polynomial overhead in time and a constant factor overhead in space. And it's something that's widely used in teaching and in applications because, because of this, it means that your model of computation doesn't matter if you're looking at complexity classes like P or NP or X or P space, because it doesn't matter which machine you're looking at, they will all be related in this way. And what they actually technically proved is they proved this instance for Turing machines and RAMs, establishing RAMs as reasonable machines. So they proved in Turing machines and RAM machines can simulate each other in this sense. Now what we're proving in this paper is we're proving the same just for Turing machines and the weak call by value lambda calculus. And to be even more precise, we're proving that with respect to the natural measures for the lambda calculus, because you have to say what time and space means, it's not as obvious as on Turing machines. And here it means that for time, we're taking the number of beta steps the computation needs to the end. And for space, we're taking the size of the largest term occurring in a computation. So really what you need to write it down, essentially the same as on Turing machines, largest configuration in a computation. And this means so the result then implies that you can define standard complexity classes like P, NP, P space, XP in terms of the lambda calculus. And if you want to carry out computations on paper or in a proof assistant in detail, you don't have to resort to Turing machines anymore. You can write nice functional programming uh, language like lambda terms. Let me mention up front as our result that our result does not cover sublinear time or space. Sublinear time or space are inherently uh, relying on the concrete machine model. So this does not work in our, in our proof. We'll look at it in the future, maybe. All right. I have to say what I mean when I say weak call by value lambda calculus. So technically, we're looking at the untyped lambda calculus. So we have variables, applications, and lambdas. In the technical details, we're using the Brown encodings of variables. It probably doesn't matter much. I won't go into detail in the talk. But in the, in the details, it's the Brown encodings. And then it's weak and call by value. Weak means don't reduce below abstractions. So essentially like in the original presentation by Plotkin. Call by value means you reduce your argument fully to a value before you plug it in. And the only values we have are lambdas, which is a bit different from the standard presentation and occurred first in the paper we had uh, with Gerd Smolka in 2017. But in essentially, it's Plotkin's lambda calculus. And then lastly, we're looking at deterministic reduction. So function, function first, argument completely second, then plug it in. All right. I have to tell you what I mean when I say the size of a term. And the size of a term, I mean it's the size of the tree if you write it down as a tree. The, the size of a variable is really the number, the index of the, the Brown variable, and the rest is straightforward. And formally, we have to define what it means, number of beta steps uh, for time. So if you have a term s, and it reduces in k steps to an abstraction, which are only our only values, then we take k as the time measure of s, and we take the maximum size with respect to this size definition as the space measure. And let me mention here that it's a bit different than Turing machines. Measures here are mapping one term to one natural number. On Turing machines, it's usually Turing machine plus input to a natural number. You don't need the input here because lambda terms can already compute without an input. And then you can, you can recover the old behavior by plugging an input into the lambda term, recovering a function lambda term plus input to, to natural number. But at first, it's just lambda term uh, to a natural number. All right. One direction of the theorem is easy. It's completely straightforward that the lambda calculus can simulate Turing machines with a polynomial time constant factor space overhead. It's already in the literature. Um, in a paper by Benjamino Acatoli and Uga Dalago in 2017, their proof doesn't state it. They only do it for, it's a different lambda calculus, and they only do it for polynomial time. But if you look at the proof closely, you see that it directly implies this result for weak call by value evaluation as well. We've mechanized the time bunch of the theorem in COC at ITP 2019. All right, the other direction is way more interesting. So I try to spend the rest of the talk 
explaining the other direction, how to simulate the lambda calculus on Turing machines in a reasonable way. And uh, there has been lots of work in this direction already. In 1996, there was the first big result in this direction. Lawal and Mersen proved that uh, the full lambda calculus is reasonable, so it can be simulated on Turing machines. If you take total ink used as the time measure, so if you write down the full computation and you measure how much time it needed to write down the full computation, every detail, that's your time measure. And maximum ink used in one computation step which is the same as we're using, size of the largest term in the computation as space measure, then actually it is a reasonable model. The issue here being that total ink used is a very crude notion and doesn't really help you uh, in practice if you want to carry something out. Twelve years later, Uga da Lago and Simone Martini proved that the lambda calculus, like we're looking at it essentially, so the weak call by value lambda calculus, is reasonable with time. And the time measure is number of beta steps plus some accounting for the size of beta redexes but already way closer to something that you would want, way closer than total ink used. And then, then in 2016, big result by Beniamino Acatoli and Uga del Lago, proving that leftmost, outermost beta steps are reasonable for the full lambda calculus. No accounting for beta steps anymore is really just, uh, no accounting for the sizes anymore. It's really just counting. Okay. Uh, one natural question to ask is why did you have to write another paper on this? I mean, del Lago and Acatoli basically solved it. Um, and the others. There are three reasons, uh, there are several reasons why we had to write, or why we wanted to write another thing about it. Um, if you want to do, for instance, mechanized complexity theory, or even are only de interested in detailed reasoning on paper, then you need several things for your model of computation. So first is, you need compositional measures. Otherwise, it's really hard to reason about it. And for compositional measures, you already need a compositional model of computation. Otherwise, it will be hard to, to mechanize anything or to do details on paper. And lastly, well, you need this for both time and space, because otherwise you can't talk about space complexity. And the issues um, why the results in the literature are not enough are, so if you look at compositional measures, then the full result by Lawal and Mersen is not enough, because total ink used is not compositional. If you, if you know the total ink used by a computation, by a lambda term, and you plug it into a bigger context, this computation will, will use co something completely different. And uh, so you can't really reason about it. You need a compositional model of computation, so Turing machines are very much not enough. If you have a seven-tape Turing machines over a binary alphabet, and a three-tape Turing machines over a ten-symbol alphabet, it's not clear what it means to compose them. And it's really hard to reason on, in detail on what they are going to do if you manage to compose them somehow. And lastly, we want both time and space so there's the Coca-Cola project led by Benjamino with all his co-authors where they're analyzing the lambda calculus, but most of the results, or all of the results in this direction covering, are covering only time, and we want space. So that's, uh, that's why we have been doing this work. And so if we have been thinking about the lambda calculus and complexity, or if you know the lambda calculus, it has been around for quite a while now, then many of you are probably thinking, wait a moment, this can't be right. It's well known already for years, and it was pointed out explicitly by, by Benjamino Acatoli and Uga da Lago in one of the papers, that there are lambda terms with very weird properties if you look at them at first. Namely, there is a lambda term as E that you can give a natural number as argument, say church encoded, which will, return, which will reduce to some constant normal form, no matter what the input is. It will do so in a linear amount of steps in the natural number, but it will use exponential time in a linear amount of steps. And you all know that P is a subset of P space, so something is off. And there is something off on the first glimpse, but really only on the first glimpse. And the key, one key to understanding why the paper works is to understand why this is not a contradiction. It is not a contradiction uh, due to this. So normally, if you prove P is a subset of P space, let's say you prove it on Turing machines, um, so you have a machine that computes a function not to bool, so a decider on natural numbers to booleans, and you have a natural number input, then on Turing machines, you know that the space consumption of this machine is bounded by the time consumption, because you need one unit of time to consume one unit of space of Turing machines. So on Turing machines, the proof that P is a subset of P space is free. It immediately follows. On RAM machines, Slotin van M. de Boer has proved this. And it doesn't hold anymore that, that this relation doesn't hold anymore. What holds on RAM machines is that the space consumption is bounded by a polynomial in the time. So you can, you can do more than one unit of space in one unit of time but still not arbitrarily much. So it's still easy to prove P is a subset of P space once you have this, because the polynomial doesn't matter because you have polynomials over there. So then you're still good. 
So the theorem for the lambda calculus that follows from our result, which makes everything, which fixes everything, is the following. If you have a machine computing a function, which is in this, in this sense then a lambda term computing a function, um, and, a, and an argument, then you can always find, for every machine, you can find an extensionally equivalent term, m prime, which has the nice behavior. So it computes the same function, but it has the nice behavior. Namely, you know for this term, you know that space is polynomially bounded by time of the new machine, and the time measure of the new machine is also bounded polynomially by the time measure of the old machine. So if you have a decider which is weird, which explodes in between, size explosion is the word, which size explodes in between, then you know that you can always optimize this using our result to a term that does not explode, and then you don't have this weird behavior anymore. You can take the new term as the decider, and then it immediately follows that P is a subset of P space because you have the properties that you wanted here. Okay, but there, there might be weird terms, but if, as long as they are Boolean functions, you can optimize them away to be not weird anymore, and then you're good. Okay, so that's, that's exactly this. So terms can exhibit size explosion, that's true, but decision functions can always be optimized to not explode, so we know P is a subset of P space. All right, let's now look really at the theorem, what we're proving, and I'll try to give you an idea of how the proof works. So first we have to look at the theorem of Acatoli and Dalago, and then we can show, then I can show you how we extend it. So they prove that there is an algorithm which takes as input the lambda term t, and which in time polynomial in the number of leftmost outermost beta steps, and the size of t outputs a linear substitution calculus term u, which is their, their kind of normal forms, such that the unfolding of u is the normal form of t. Now we can check what we are proving, and I'll show you the, detail, the differences. So we're proving there is an algorithm, in this sense a Turing machine, which takes as input a closed L term, so we call by value lambda calculus term T, and which, in time polynomial in the number of beta steps, no need for leftmost outermost anymore because we're deterministic, and the size of T, so it's exactly the same. And now, because we're, we're considering space, and space linear in the size of the largest term in the reduction, outputs a heap containing a term U such the unfolding is the normal form. We're using heaps instead of linear substitution calculi because, because they're easier to represent on Turing machines, but essentially it's, it's very comparable from a high level. Okay. Unfolding, the unfolding here and the unfolding here both take time polynomial in the number of beta steps and the size of the result. Um, because if we're looking at complexity classes, you're only looking at decision functions, results will be Boolean, so constant sized. So this doesn't matter anymore. And you know that for decision functions, evaluation is polynomial in the only in the beta steps, and you can define p, np, p space, and so on in terms of the weak by value lambda calculus, but not uh, sublinear time or space as mentioned before. All right. Now, how do you prove this? In order to understand how you can prove it, we have to look at size explosion again, and I'll try to give you more details how these this strange terms that can explode look. So the easiest exploding term uh, is using exponential on church numerals. So church numerals are n-fold uh, application of one argument to the other. Exponentiation in church numerals is very easy. It's just application the other way around. And we're looking at church booleans, which is also straightforward to encode. And then the weird term will do the following. It will take an argument x, it will compute 2 to the x, and throw it away. Computing 2 to the x works in linear time, so this, s, uh, this strange term applied to a natural number will take a linear, amount, a linear amount of time to go to the Boolean true, but since it will compute 2 to the n in between, it is exponentially big in between. So that's the strange term. Um, now, by looking at the term, you can already see something. Namely, you can see that if you're using the most naive substitution strategy there is, namely just, plug, just copying things around like you would do on paper, you're wrong for time because you're copying exponential things around. But you're good for space, because we exactly have defined space like this, exactly what you need to write it down. So naive copying is OK for space. So you can get an easy theorem. The Turing machines can simulate L with a constant factor overhead in space using the most naive strategy. Unfortunately, for time, this strategy is exponentially wrong, because you're, expo you're copying exponentially big things. And second easy theorem, nobody in practice actually implements Turing machines using copying. You use closures. You use a heap. You use environments. You can do this on Turing machines as well. So you can prove that Turing machines can simulate L with a polynomial overhead in time using a heap-based strategy. Would be nice if we're done here. We're not done here, sadly, because for space, this strategy has a logarithmic factor overhead. The reason is that your pointers can become too big on some terms. 
Um, I have an example, but I won't have the time to show it. And the situation we're in is as follows. We know that the substitution-based strategy is OK for space, wrong for time on space exploding terms. The heat-based strategy is OK for time, wrong for space due to pointer explosion. And so now we're in a situation where we have two strategies and they don't, both don't work. And the, the big insight of the paper is size exploding terms do not exhibit pointer explosion. Because if you explode, you will have enough time, you will have enough space for the pointers definitely because they're exponentially big. So the solution is we just use both strategies at the same time. For each K, we first run the substitution based strategy. If it explodes, we stop and run the heat based strategy because this now has enough space. And then we do this for every K until we find the solution. Uh, in the paper, we do this in detail. So we have a substitution-based and a heat-based stack machine first, verified in cock in all details. Then we turn them into Turing machines, um, which is a bit sketchy because you can't write the whole Turing machine. And then we give a detailed proof of the Turing machine interleaving the two strategies. All right. So to conclude, what we have is we have shown that the natural measures for the weak call by value lambda calculus are compositional for a compositional model of computation because the lambda calculus is very compositional, cover both time and space, can be used to define standard complexity classes. And now this means are maybe feasible to use in mechanizations and cock are feasible to use on paper if you really want to give all details of your proof that P is equal to NP or whatever you want to prove. Yeah. So in future work, we'd like to mechanize basic complexity theory uh, in cock. That's mainly Fabian's line of work. So if you're interested in this, talk to us later. Talk especially to Fabian later. We can also, we'd also like to extend the results a bit on the theoretical side. So for instance, it would be interesting to extend the result to the full lambda calculus. Currently, we can only do weak call by value evaluation. It would be interesting to check how sublinear time and space work, possibly by treating input using computational effects. Um, really interesting would be to prove that P is a subset of P space using the lambda calculus only, because currently our proof goes via Turing machines to do the optimization. And that's, that's not really nice, but it's also not clear how to do it without sequential models. And lastly, the space measure has size explosion. That's not a huge issue because, as I showed, you can, you can optimize it away, but it's still counterintuitive. In practice, it doesn't occur too much because you write the terms and you will not accidentally write a strange term. But in general, it would still be nicer to not have this counterintuitive property. So it would be good if somebody can come up with this. All right. That's the end of my talk. I'm happy to answer questions. Hi. Uh, I wonder if you might explain the relationship to work by Blalock and Greiner and Narlikar about time and space for both sequential and parallel complexity for lambda terms, call by value lambda calculus. So we've, we've checked the work and checked whether the result follows from their result. And that's not the case. They've been, I think they've been the first to, to prove any result for space. But I don't recall what the exact result for space is. I, d I don't recall what the exact result for space is, so I can't yes, complain. Yes, uh, Narlikar, uh, Blalik and Narlikar were yeah, doing space, yeah, yeah. and Greiner was doing parallel. Yes. Parallel, uh, so they're doing, sequential. they have a result for space, but it's not exactly this result. So uh, I, I would have to check, but we can talk about it. We can talk about it. Yeah. Any more questions? Can you give some insights into any steps you might have taken uh, towards future work? Um, so we haven't tackled anything in particular. So the, the, most, the most time we've spent on thinking about sublinear time and space, because there the issue is that, um, there the issue is, I can go back to the slide. The issue is that the time measure, here, the time measure has the size of t. And if you're taking, if you're looking at the input, um, the input will already be counted into the time measure. The size mm -hmm. of the input will always be counted into the time measure. So you have to find the definition of everything where you do not count the input immediately. Okay. And one way to do it might be to extend the lambda calculus with an oracle, which, or with, a, yeah, with an oracle which you can query to access the input. Because on Turing machines, you have an input tape. On, on the lambda calculus, there's no such thing. But you can extend the lambda calculus kind of with an input tape, potentially, mm -hmm. where you can say, OK, give me the seventh bit, and then it says one and then work with this. So that's possible that the, actually the same result, the same strategy works for this extended lambda calculus. But that's, that's just wide guessing. Sure. Yeah. OK. Any other questions in the meantime? Yes.
so that's a really nice piece of work. It's nice to know that we can move to lambda calculi, right? Sort of echoes Turing's original result where he proved Turing machines and lambda calculi were equivalent. He said, so this means we can use the more elegant lambda calculus, which everybody then ignored. Um, what, this is a stupid question, it's because I'm not up on this area. What's the relationship between Turing machines and models like RAM that are closer to our actual machines? And again, is there any hope for equivalences with things like references? So normally people use references because they're much more efficient than pure lambda calculus. Is there any hope of showing that for reasoning, we wouldn't need to go that far? So Turing machines and RAM machines have been treated. And it's exactly, poly it's exactly the, same, the same connection. And the proof is a lot more tricky than you might think, and especially the space measure for RAM machines is a lot trickier than you might think. But it's, it's in the paper by Slot and Van M. de Boas, and they've worked it out. Uh, it's here. They have worked it out in detail. For references, you mean references in the lambda calculus? Yes. Or, OK. Interesting. Uh, we haven't thought about this. But in the same way, as I said before, that you might have an a computational effect which can query the tape, you might be able to add more basic effects. And if it's just the heap that you, or just the just register that you're ac accessing, that might be easy to incorporate in the simulation because because we already have a heap to simulate the lambda calculus. Adding a second heap for pointers might not be too hard, but don't know. It'd be fun if you could do it. It'd be interesting to see what you could find out. We see. Okay. Thank you. Let's thank the speaker again uh, and move on to the next.